If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Revelation, the sixth chapter. I just want to catch you up if you haven't been here the last couple of weeks. Now, looking at the book of Revelation is not the easiest book for any person to read, to understand it. The best way to interpret Scripture in seminary called a class in hermeneutics is you interpret Scripture with Scripture. And to understand the New Testament, you have to have a good understanding of the Old Testament. Unfortunately, a lot of people, when it comes to the Old Testament, even people in the church, are kind of out to dinner. Um, and not trying to insult anyone or anything, but most people concentrate in reading the New Testament and at the uh, or discounting the Old Testament. When you see Scripture referred to in the New Testament, in the days of Jesus, the writings of Paul, referring to Old Testament Scripture, you see that apocalyptic language, apocalyptic means an unveiling, a revelation. You see a lot of symbols and numbers in the book of Revelation. This is something that was clearly seen and noticed in the Old Testament, a lot of apocalyptic language. A lot of illustrations in the Old Testament are talks about the sun, the stars, and the moon, and cataclysmic events and things like that. And some people try to interpret Scripture from a literal point of view. Sometimes it is to be taken literally. Sometimes it's poetic. Sometimes it's symbolic. Sometimes it's prophetic. So you have to understand the context of what's being said and look at it. One thing I've found about numbers in the book of of the, in the Bible is you can't take it in a literal sense. Certain numbers mean certain things. The number three refers to um, the triune being and the nature of God. Seven, completion. Six, incorrect and imperfection and problems and things of that nature. Twelve, government. So, I mean, when you look at the consensus, the information, and you look at these numbers, you can see it's talking about something is significant, something is important here, and kind of gives you uh, a signpost. But when you try to take and look at it in a literal sense, you usually miss what God's trying to say. And hopefully, what we can do, we can make personal application of when we study the Word of God, even the book of Revelation. Now, this book was written around 95 or 96 A.D. It was the last decade of the first century. The church was just made alive within that first century. When you see the Spirit of God descending upon those people in the upper room. And you see a new and living way. You see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so... When this letter was written, is written to those Christians, particularly in Asia Minor, which we know as Turkey today. And so, you, you would see how people take the book of Revelation today and just do sorts of bizarre speculation. They'll say, for people in the last days to buy and sell according to the book of Revelation and say you have to adhere to the UPC symbol which is probably the mark of the beast. Now think about that. The people in the last decade, the first century did they know anything about the UPC symbol? Oh they all knew what that was. You know I mean can you see how people take current events and try to make the Bible adhere to those things and a lot of times if you're looking at the scriptures and it's speaking to those people at that point in time but you're projecting it thousands of years ahead of time what good is it going to be to them now there is progressive revelation in the scriptures I look back 2,000 years ago you look back 2,000 years ago Jesus lived he died, 
He was buried, but he came out of the grave. Hallelujah. That was an historical event that happened that impacted those people that day and time. And you know what? It's still impacting people today, thousands of years later. But for me to understand, for you to understand this book, which has a lot of symbolism, an extraordinary amount of symbolism and numbers, You've got to understand historical significance and not take it out of context and then at the same time say, well, God, how does this work here in the 21st century? Now, I read a book on the book of Revelation that was written in the 1930s. Now, the advantage I had was I'm way down the road from that point in time. And they thought, the end of the world was going to happen in the next few years because what they read in Revelation and what Hitler was doing, who was an antichrist, who was filled with the spirit of antichrist, and there's been many antichrists before him and thereafter. Antichrist is a spirit. And when you see it, how he was... Uh, so filled with the devil and how he controlled the minds of people at that point in time and how he maneuvered and even got the church to cooperate with him in Germany. And yet there were men like Dietrich Bonhoeffer who took an opposition towards that to the point where he was willing to lay his life down and he did lose his life. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was an extraordinary man of God who would not compromise. There's still a remnant, even in the midst of a lot of people just out of fear, say, okay, Hitler, you're going to bring about the Third Reich, and, and it's going to be like the Roman Empire revisited, and what happens, you're going to give us our dignity back, and we're going to get out of this horrific inflation and this depression and all this discouragement, and you're going to be our Savior and Redeemer. So it looked like, yeah, this is the book of Revelation being fulfilled and the mark of the beast. To be an SS troop during those times who were followers of Hitler who saw him as the Fuhrer and they dedicated their life to him, they were marked, and there was a tattoo placed right here. And these guys gave their life. There were uh, probably several hundred thousand men who did that. And so they, oh, that's the mark of the beast right there. And, and you could see how they just grabbed that and said this. Yeah, things in Revelation and those ungodly, horrific things, such as the four horsemen of the apocalypse being poured out, which is war, and then as a result of war, you have famine and pestilence and death, which is happening at that point in time in the first century and is even happening today. I don't know any time in my life, and I've been around 71 years, there hasn't been a war going on somewhere. I was born at the end of the World War II and then the Korean War in the 1950s, and then my generation, the Vietnam War. And then there's Desert Storm. And then there's Iraq again. I mean, when is it there hasn't been something going on? Those horses are still riding today. All right? And so I said, well, that's, that's yet to happen. Well, it's happening right now. Come on, wake up. <laughs> you know? And... So, so what we want to do is we want to see what was happening in that day and time. Not take scripture out of context, but at the same time, see what God is saying to us today and how we need to have that solid foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When I say the gospel of Jesus Christ, the quintessence of the gospel is outlined in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Jesus lived he was crucified, he was buried, but here's the miracle. He came out of the grave. He overcame hell and sin and death and the power of the grave, and he conquered the enemy. And people say, well, why doesn't God deal with the issue of evil? He has through his son, Jesus. And when you come to Christ, you overcome the devil. You overcome 
sin and the consequences of sin and the wrath of God. You, if the world would accept Christ and come to Jesus, we would see a lot of the things that happened here in Nashville this morning where a guy went into a Waffle House. Evidently, I don't know the details, killed three people, if I'm correct, and wounded four. A Waffle House. I'm going to stop eating at the Waffle House. No, I mean, <laughs> I mean, things like that. When I was growing up, there were things happening then, but not to the extent now. There's a Savior. We need him. His name is Jesus. Can you say amen? Now, I'm going to read some scripture here. I'm going to read it from the non-inspired version, the NIV. <laughs> the reason why, when I was teaching one of my CMT classes, and I was reading 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 9, and I said, Thou searchest here and there. And then my friend Fred said, Searcheth? What meaneth thou? <laughs> so thou knowest not thy word, brother? <laughs> so I want to bring it to a more uh, convenient vernacular. Can you say amen? All right. If you don't like this, I'll read the Greek next week. Original ma manuscript. Okay. Um, Revelation chapter 6, beginning in verse... 9. No, verse 12. Excuse me. What happens in verse 12? The sixth seal is being opened. Who is worthy to take the book and break the seals? Anyone have that answer? Amen. No one they found could open the seals. No one can bring revelation to your heart and mind. No one can take the word of God and cause it to become a living reality in the heart and mind. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, God Almighty, is the only one who can redeem a person. The only one who can take the scales off a person's eyes. Jesus is the only one that can take the Word of God and really give you the truth. Because He is the truth. Amen? I watched. And He's opened the sixth seal. And there was a great earthquake. And the sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat's hair. Try What does that look like? The whole moon turned blood red. And the stars in the sky fell to earth. And as late figs dropped from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The sky seemed like a scroll and rolling up. And every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the princes and the generals and the rich and the mighty and every slave and every free man hid in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called for the mountains and the rocks to fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? Wow, that sounds like a bad place to be in, doesn't it? When you look at this, when I read the scripture, I realized this was a prelude to the wrath of God. What is the wrath of God? Now, we'll look when we read in chapter 7. It talks about the saints of God talks about the servants of God it says and ask a question there I'm kind of jumping ahead a bit it says who are these people who are standing before the throne of God they can't be numbered from every race every tribe every nation every tongue who are who are these people though they are those who came out of the great tribulation now in 95 AD the churches in Asia Minor and through the inhabited world who knew Christ were going through great tribulation. The Roman Empire, Domitian, I mean, he was chopping heads off. He took this man who wrote this book and dipped him in hot oil and then banished him to the island of Patmos. To me, that's pretty bad. 
what greater tribulation is there if you say, Lord, I'm a lover of you and a follow you, and then someone takes and puts a knife to your throat and says, you renounce Jesus, the Lord and Savior, or else you're going to die. The only way you could say, my life's not my own, is that you know that there's an eternity, and this is not the end of your life. Jesus said, I am the resurrection life, and he that believeth me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Do you believe this? I don't know. I, you know I, I see now there are more Christians being martyred for the faith than it was during the time of the writing of this book. For you, in the days ahead, my grandchildren, great grandchildren, I pray for them that they'll be marked for God because now we're seeing in this nation where Christians are being more persecuted now than they were before. They're saying because a lot of evangelicals voted for Donald Trump that they are bigoted, meaning narrow-minded, and they're deceived and duped. And you Christians stop putting biblical moral absolutes upon us. Listen, a person doesn't believe in God, doesn't have any foundation for morality. How can they say what's good and what's bad or what's evil and what's righteous if there's no god then every man becomes a god unto himself and he decides what's right and wrong i go back to the word of god and god tells me to love my wife as christ loves the church and for me to do something that's not that such as committing adultery or doing something ungodly that's sin that's not right but now you have people who is saying, no, that's how we are. That's our nature. We're, we're going to follow that lifestyle that we want. I have young people telling me, there's nothing wrong with sleeping with so-and-so, even though we're not married. Everybody's doing it. Everyone is lined up, as Christine said, on the Brooklyn Bridge, and they're jumping off, getting in line. I don't want to be married to a woman that's committed to me 99% of the time, but 1% of the time she's running here or there, or vice versa, right? Does that sound like good counsel? When Dinah married me, she expected me to love her 100% of the time. And because two things that keep me straight... Not my intellect, my, not my college degrees or seminary degree, my f love of God and my fear of God. I don't want to be nailed to the wall and hung out to dry. You know? <laughs> so you, when you look here and we're looking at this sixth seal, you see this apocalyptic language. It talks about the sun being dark and the moon turning the blood, and the star falling to the earth. If a star falls and hits the earth, we will be no more. If the sun moves a further away, we freeze to death. If it moves just a little towards us, we burn up. And so I read this, and I don't take it in a literal sense. If a star hits the earth, boom. So what, what is all this apocalyptic language? What, what is this saying? You look in the book of Isaiah, chapter 13, verses 9 through 13, it pretty much says the same thing as talking about Babylon, which was completely full of evilness and corruption. And what it was saying was God's wrath was being poured out on Babylon, and God was dealing with that wicked empire, and it was no longer. You can look and just the 20th century, you see empires that had come and gone. Nazism, responsible for killing millions of people. Stalin. I remember uh, not long ago, well, several times I've been in the former Soviet Union, and they said to me, the people who lived back during the 1930s and 40s, and they said to me, Hitler was evil, but Stalin was worse. He was a butcher. 
He killed many of our people, put them in slave camps, and executed many. You hear a lot about Hitler, but not as much about Stalin. But Stalin was worse than Hitler as far as people being killed and exterminated and genocide being practiced. Those things are still happening today in our world. The book of Revelation and what it was saying at that point in time does have a continuous effect and things are happening now. It says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh cruel, both with the wrath and fierce anger of the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give light. The sun sh shall be darkened in going forth and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. That was in the book of Isaiah. You see similar language now in the book of Revelation. And so what you had, the end of the Babylonian Empire, and then we look back in history, and we see the end of the Roman Empire who was oppressing the church in Asia Minor. And you see that the fate of Roman, even though it was a world superpower back in B.C. times and then up to 476 A.D., 1,300 years. How long has America been around? About 300? 1,300 years. You can see Daniel prophesying and seeing the Persian, the Medes, the Greeks, and the Romans all subsiding and ending, but yet you see the kingdom of God breaking forth and the wrath of God being poured out on these empires, and yet the kingdom of God is still moving forward. Has been, is, and shall be. The kingdom of God, a lot of people pervert that today, is real simple. It's not meat and drink. It's, it's not something that's of this world. It's joy and peace and righteousness in the Holy Spirit. It's where the sovereign God rules and reigns in your heart and life. So when I go home this afternoon, I want to see not the United States being represented, you know, necessarily in my home, which I thank God for my country, but the kingdom of God. There's joy in my home. There's peace in my home and the righteousness of God. Now, at times... The enemy has come in, the flesh of man, and try to disrupt that. But we walk in forgiveness, repentance, and remove those obstacles. I go to McDonald's, get a cup of coffee. The kingdom of God is there. Instead of giving me the senior cup, they give me the large cup. Hallelujah. <laughs> you, you can go into a place that's dark, and God shine through you the kingdom of God is available I've gone into a bar not to get a shot of whiskey or a beer I remember I was up in New York small town I was running that day I ran six miles from my buddy's hunt camp down to the uh, tavern that his wife owned there in Andover New York it was hot in the summer, went in there. I says, give me a sarsaparilla. <laughs> no, what is that? A soda? <laughs> give me an ice cold glass of water. And they knew her. Well, hey, Rev. And end up having a conversation with the people in that establishment about the things of God. The kingdom of God reigned and ruled that day. The kingdom of God is where sovereign God reigns and rules. Amen? And so you go somewhere, you don't lower yourself down to the status of that environment or those people. You come in, not trying to be offensive, but you come in and you can bless people, pray for people, and let God use and speak through you. Can you say amen? The wrath of God upon humanity. So, here, what we read, when the sixth seal is open, it's a prelude to the wrath of God coming upon the Roman Empire that was oppressing those seven churches and even more so in that day and time. The epitome of the wrath of God 
is found in Revelation chapter 20 and also chapter 21 and other places. It says the wrath of God is where the second death takes place. And what in the world is a second death? What's the first death? It's appointed, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. It's appointed on the man once to die. After this, the judgment. Everybody here will experience the first death. That's when your body just gets worn out. You've gone, Kathy, too many times to L.A. Fitness, and you just wore out your body. I'll go up there. And Kathy's riding a bike. And she can't get nowhere. She, she, she's working hard. She still hasn't moved one inch. And she got a book there. You walk by and she never sees you. I go, hey, Kathy. I'm here. Oh, hey, Pastor Baker. She's got these books. I mean, she reads more books than are in the library at Rose Creek. <laughs> but uh, I'm just picking on Kathy. So <laughs> what I mean... You, your body does wear out, but she's smart. She's exercising. It's like Victoria and, and Courtney. They get over there exercise. Good people go to L.A. Fitness. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? I hear two or three. <laughs> but you know, your body wears out. Here's what the Bible says. The outward man is perishing, but the inward man is being renewed every day. So in a sense, spiritually, you're getting younger and healthier. But eventually, your body wears out. That's the first death. And everyone experienced that. If you know Jesus, you just relocate. It's just a relocation. You go from living here into another dimension called eternity into the presence of God if you know Jesus. The second death, it says, where hell and death are cast into the lake of fire. That means a second death. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you're born of God and you're sealed by God, he lives in your heart and life, you will not experience a second death. A second death is where people who have rejected God and said simply to God, they're good people, maybe moral people, but they say, God, I have no time for you, no room for you. Stay out of my life. I live my life for myself. And then they close their eyes for the last time and they experience eventually the second death where death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. And those people are the ones who said to God the unforgivable sin where you reject the convicting power of the Holy Spirit and you simply say to God, hey look, uh, I'll check you later. I'll work this out when I stand at the judgment throne. Too late. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the day of salvation. So, this is a prelude, and the sixth seal is open. And it says that when this begins to happen, it says, those who don't know God, those whose eyes are blind, it says, that fear grips their heart. And they want to hide from God. There are people who are not even suffering the wrath of God who are still hiding from God. Still running away from God. I have high school buddies that I reconnected with because I still visit my hometown. I remember a guy who went to school with his name was Gary Van Allen. And Gary grew up in a religious context where he never had a personal relationship with God, but out of religion, out of duty, out of obligation, he went through a certain procedure, a certain uh, uh, situation or methodology, you might say, where he seemed to appease his conscience, but he really never had a real work of the power of God in his life. So I'm visiting in my hometown, and I run into him and start conversation with him, and he tells me, he says, 
I'm sick and I'm dying. My days are numbered. I said, do you mind if I ask you a real personal question, Gary? He says, what's that? I says, are you ready to meet God? Because everybody's going to live somewhere forever. There is an eternity. There is life after death, either in the presence of God or complete isolation, separation from God for all eternity. There's light, there's darkness. There's a heaven, there's a hell. There's a God, there's a devil. I said, do you know God in a personal, intimate way? Do you have hope beyond the grave? He says, I don't. Can you help me? We're sitting at a delicatessen at a grocery store. And at that place in time, I led him to know Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, in a personal, intimate way, and he gave his life to Jesus. Now, most of his life, he didn't live for God. Most of his life, he just lived for himself. He wasn't a bad person. He had a son who was an attorney, had a wife, seemed to have it together, had a nice house, had a mean dog. So I didn't go into his house. I said, I am visiting you. You come down to the grocery store. And, but God had mercy upon him. See, salvation is not of us. Salvation is of God. And God will choose who he'll have mercy on and who he'll pour his wrath out upon. And I pray, God, I pray that you have mercy on me and judge me not according to your law because I'll fall short. And so when the wrath of God begins to be poured out as it was a prelude to what was happening to the Roman Empire. It says, fear gripped the heart and mind of, of man. Listen. If just drawing near to God because I reverence God and he's a holy God, there's a sense of fear and awesomeness, the creator of the whole universe and God Almighty coming down and knocking on your door. When you look in the Bible, when Isaiah in chapter 6 had a visible appearance, they call it a theological term, a theophany of God Almighty, he said, God, you must help me. And here Isaiah was a good man. He says, God, if you don't reach out and touch me, I will disintegrate. And like a hot coal from the throne of God came and touched Isaiah, he was able to have that revelation and that visible appearance of a mighty, awesome God. I don't take God in a casual, nonchalant way. As I read in the Word, that's enough for me to say, I humble myself before you, Almighty God. When God passed by Moses and he revealed himself to Moses, Moses, God was merciful, hit him in the cleft of the rock when he passed by, and he only saw the behind side of God because no person can look into the eyes of God and live because he's so holy so awesome so majestic and so you can imagine when god says enough's enough i'm going to deal with these romans who are persecuting my newborn early church and it says the fear of god comes upon them and they try to find the place to hide in the book of hebrews hebrews it says here's a noun that describes god Someone comes up to you and says, who is God? Um, uh, 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 well, uh, uh, I remember uh, years ago, there was this young man who was dating my daughter. I did not like him. I didn't like most of except maybe Scott and Jimmy. <laughs> A lot of them I did not like. And I said to my daughter, this guy you're dating is not a man of God. He's a piece of dirt. No, I didn't say that. I thought that. You. <laughs> and so she told him, my dad said, you're not a man of God. So he came to me and he said, your daughter said that you said I wasn't a man of God. And I said, that's right. So tell me about God. What's he doing in the earth today? What's his name? What's his nature? point made he said 
You look in the Bible, it says God's a spirit. God is light. God is love. And here in Hebrews, God's a consuming fire. And then he explains here in Hebrews what a consuming fire is. He says, he's promised in that day he will shake the heaven and the earth to remove those things that can be shaken so those things which cannot be shaken may remain. And the only thing that will remain at the end of time is those who are born of God and God's kingdom. And God's going to shake everything that can be shaken, both in heaven and in earth. He says in the book of Revelation, the end of time, at the end of the age, you create a new heaven, a new earth. And so you can see where when God begins to part the wrath of God, and as we take from here and we go into the seventh seal, you'll see the wrath of God being poured out upon the Roman Empire. But let me give you some good news. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. Beginning in verse 7 and 8, it says, it talks about us putting on our faith and love as the breastplate and the hope of our salvation is our helmet. And then he says in verse 9, for God did not appoint us believers to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They didn't say we wouldn't have tribulation. Has anyone here ever had any form of tribulation? A trial? A disappointment? A heartbreak? Unjustly accused? You felt like when tribulation comes, it could be where you raise a child, you love a man, you love a woman, and then... No rhyme or reason. They just say, do you know what? I don't really care about you. Adios. And walk out of your life. Or you invest in that life and you spend time and then they just remove themselves and they start doing things that just break your heart. It hurts you. A broken heart. Who can heal a broken heart? And it's just not something that's in your head, but you actually feel it in your heart. You actually feel pain. And there's songs written in Nashville. <laughs> songs written in the 60s. Who can heal a broken heart? I remember one of them I used to listen to, and I know that I've been guilty when I was in my prime of breaking hearts. Then one day my heart was broken for about three or four minutes. <laughs> then I recovered. <laughs> but I mean, it's a painful thing. How many people here have ever had a broken heart? Raise your hand. Something's broke your heart. I, it, it don't have to be a guy or a girl. It could be, you know, your parents. It could be a good friend. Those things, those are, uh, that's a tribulation. And there are many people in the body of Christ down through the ages who suffered trials and tribulation. You look at some of the, you know what God has used, persecution and tribulation. Because we talked about the fifth seal where those were martyred. And they said, how long before you avenge us, O oh God? He says, you got to wait. Be patient because there's many to follow thereafter. More people are being martyred for the cause of Christ today. In 60 countries in, a, in our world, people are suffering because of the faith in Christ. And God has used persecution and martyrdom to advance the church. There are places in the world now 
or because of persecution. You see, in the first century, it was persecution that sent the disciples to the inhabited known world at that time to preach the gospel. God uses suffering. Jesus set the example. He says he learned obedience to the things which he suffered. And then it says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 43, or maybe 46, it says, is the disciple above his Lord or the servant above his master? If it happened to Jesus and you're going to follow Jesus, more than likely it's going to happen to you. And then there's the big question here. The great day of God's wrath has come. Who shall be able, if you fill in the blank, stand? The answer, the servants of God are sealed in their forehead. Any trial or tribulation, or even when the wrath is being poured out, who's able to stand? Only those who've been sealed. Now, what is the seal of God? When you look in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, it talks about those people who are born of God are sealed by the Holy Spirit. It's a spiritual sealing. I remember people say, Pastor Baker, will I get the mark of the beast? At the end time, would I come up and put 666 on my head? No, I'm not talking about in a literal sense. I'm going to tell you what. No devil, no demon, no Hitler, no Stalin, no Kim Jong-un can put a seal upon you. No one can break the seal of God. That's one of my prayers. I pray for friends. I pray for people I know, my own family members. God, I ask that you mark them, that you seal them with the Holy Ghost. When you're born of God, part of your down payment, your inheritance, which is a spiritual inheritance, God seals you, marks you. Doesn't give you the right to go out and sin and live an ungodly life. He seals you to live a holy life. He marks you, and no demon, no devil can break that seal. Can you say amen? He says, beginning in verse uh, chapter, I mean, beginning in verse, excuse me, chapter 7. Get there. It says that there are four angels that stand at the four corners of the earth and hold back the wrath of God until it says the servants of God are sealed. And then next week we'll go in and we we'll talk about it says the 144,000. And then he says also there's a great host which couldn't be numbered. And so we'll talk about that group of people. There's a lot of people who take the 144,000. There's uh, religions in the world who use that in a literal sense and say that means that we're going to have 144,000 people who will be servants of God. And when we hit that mark, then we know we have come to the end of time. And then they had to change their thinking and their theology because they surpassed 144,000. And people take it, and it's so, so many bizarre things, but we'll talk about that in detail, amen? But I want to tell you, if you have been marked by Jesus, and you have come to a place where you simply say, Lord, I don't understand everything in the Bible, but you know what? I need you. God, forgive me my sins. God, give me hope beyond the grave. Mark me, God. I believe, I confess, and God says, you're marked. You're marked. I give you the gift of eternal life. God doesn't change his mind from day to day like we do. Salvation is like this. It's positional. We walk many times by our feelings. One day, oh, I feel I'm saved. Oh, I feel like goofed up. I'm lost. Oh, Oh, no, I'm saved today. Oh, I'm lost tomorrow. Up and down, up and down. Jesus says, you belong to me. He doesn't come back and say, oh, you know what? Larry, you really goofed up. <laughs> I'm taking that back. 
When you are born of God, he marks you because we're broken. We have a malignancy in our soul that needs to be cured. And the only cure for that malignancy is Jesus. And then what happens when you're born again, then the process, what theologians call sanctification, being set apart into God, and you begin to grow and mature. You begin to become a worshiper. You become a servant of God. You begin to love God. You pattern your life after the Lord Jesus. You walk in holiness and righteousness. You become a blessing, not a curse. You become an answer and not a problem. You begin to know and you're reassured and you can face trials and tribulations. You can face the devil, hell itself, and you say, my life is hidden Christ. And I'm secure in that. I might not be the greatest theologian, the greatest Bible teacher, but I know one thing. I know that my Savior lives. I'm persuaded that he can keep that which I've committed unto him. My life is hidden Christ. Would you please stand?